All right, guys. Welcome back to – I hope you haven't seen him yet because I want to do a dramatic entry. Welcome back. It's really windy here, first off. Welcome yeah. back to the Colin Man's. Oh, dude, they saw you. They saw you. Well, without further ado, my guest today, we're going to call this the Mitchell Ulrich checkup. Not like checkup as in like I'm his doctor, but checkup as in like – This is a doctoral checkup by my future lawyer friend. Yeah, yeah, it's true. But yeah, dude, you know – I'm sure if you have been following my podcast for a while, you heard our one of our early podcasts or the early one of my early podcasts with Mitchell Ulrich. But if you haven't, this is Big Mitch. Go ahead and introduce yourself for everyone who's new. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I play football with Colin. That's how we met. Um, actually, we may have met before. I think I was in. We were in Disneyland at the same time, and uh, we may have seen each other. And I think I felt some kind of connection in the air, but. Uh, I don't know what that was until I met him. I didn't figure that out. Until I will say this. He probably didn't see me, but there's a, my voice cracked, but there's a good chance that I saw him. Imagine you're in Disneyland and it's all grad night. So it's all grad students. And there's a six, nine guy walking there. It's pretty hard to miss. So I'm pretty sure I saw him. Don't know if he saw me, but yeah, um, we do play football. Yeah. yeah I, kind I, of. Play, I play left tackle and, uh, I get to watch Colin kick field goals, which is one of the great pleasures of my life. Yes. I haven't kicked a field goal since I got injured, though, dude. I've been just punting now. It's crazy to think yeah. about. Well, I mean, I guess I haven't really seen any field goals recently, but yeah, so. Yeah, that's true. When's the last time you saw a field goal? It's been probably like 500-something days. Because uh, I've been on the field, you know what I mean? And yeah. Just or like, yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, but, for I mean, yeah, I hadn't played for 400 something days before we got injured and then it's been another like eight weeks now so seven weeks well Crazy. We, do you just want to jump in straight into it because everyone yeah. who's not on the football team is like what are they talking about 500 days we, they just played all right mitch what happened on i don't remember the date march 13th 8 20 20 like 29th 27th something like that i don't know march 29th second play of the game what happened yeah i got rolled up on uh you know it was a pretty solid play we were I think we gained like six or seven yards which was good I was downfield which is always a fantastic sign as an offensive lineman um so uh I just got rolled up on an unfortunate situation that happens and then uh so I uh snapped my tibia in half my fibula compound fractured which means it like basically came out of my leg um like the bone did and then uh it like twisted my foot too. So I tore almost all of my tendons in my foot. So the Achilles stayed intact, which was solid. That's a, that's a big one. That's a big win. That is a big yeah. win. Yeah. I think it was like, I think he said like 40 something percent. So I guess not half, but like pretty good chunk of my tendons got completely severed or something. So, and then I had some nerve stuff in my foot, but everything's growing back. So, you know, I got, I had a really good surgeon. Uh, we just like immediate, right from the fields onto the ambulance and then tried to find a surgeon. I was in the area and uh, you know, a few of them, <laughs> I think they texted a couple of them or something. And uh, they, uh, they suggested that I go to like the big orthopedic surgeon guy in the area because uh, just the severity of the injury. So, so we, we made it to the hospital in Portland, which is like a 40 minute drive, which I was a pretty brutal 40 minutes. Yeah. And, yeah. So it was, it was an interesting night, a very interesting night had like a mixed emotions of like oh man am I ever going to be able to walk again or and like oh like I don't know like oh this isn't that bad like I've seen people have worse and then you know like the nurses are like staring at it and like ogling at it and uh you know that's a little intimidating when these like medical professionals there's like eight of them around you and they're all like oh yeah that might be like the worst one we've ever seen and that's like an intimidating thing so yeah but it was, it was good. I mean, I'm not walking yet, but getting there. So, I will say this. One of the most emotional things I've ever been through was when you, this big 6'9 dude, was one of the most happy-go-lucky guys, happy guys who never really puts too much negativity in the air. None, actually, really. I mean, if it is, it's like, let's go get that like in a football context against the other people, you know? And that's good negativity, I think. But you. when you got hype being carted off the field with one of the worst injuries, either probably the worst injury I've ever seen personally in my life, 
dude, everybody could feel that. Everyone's like, fuck, man. And they're all hard. And then you went hype. And, you know, that led gave our team so much momentum, I believe. But it was just so emotional to see some guy, a guy like you, who's a leader, who's one of the captains on this team for sure, um, getting, you know, cut off on a horrible injury and still having that positive energy, you know. Uh, I can't even imagine what you were going through. I've been through – three or four injuries now, nothing near as severe as you've been through. Um, in a context where your, your adrenaline's like through the roof, second play, and obviously I don't play a position that's high angst the entirety of the game, but uh, I've played many countless sports with that anxiety and that intenseness, so I can't even imagine second play of the game, you get rolled up on. Did you know instantly that something was wrong? No, not instantaneously. I mean. Um... When I saw it, I did, obviously. <laughs> but, uh, like, I mean, when it first happened, I was just like, ah, shit. Like, I just sprained my ankle or something. I feel like I just rolled my ankle. You know, usually when you roll your ankle, it just, like, pop, pretty much just pops right back into place. Like, it might hurt. You might, you know, it hurt a little bit. But, like, in the end, it's it's fine. Um, but so I just kind of, like, looked at it, glanced at it real quick. And then I looked away. And then I, like, looked back. And I was like, oh, fuck. And that's when I, like, freaked out for a second. So I, I had definitely had like a moment where I like yelled, Oh fuck. Like mm -hmm. that's, that's not good. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I you know, I it took me a second and then I think my adrenaline kicked in. And I was like, I'm not in like a ton of pain right now. Like I'm just going to not look at it. Like this does no, there's no use in getting negative right now. Like I don't want to go into shock. I don't want to freak out. Like, let me just like take a breath, calm down. And, uh, so, you know, that was, very helpful I think in like the whole process of getting to the hospital quick and and all that but um you know when I, my initial like my calmness started to kick in is when everybody else around me started seeing it so it was really tough to stay calm when everybody was screaming around me and like yelling and stuff it was that was yeah, yeah. when I, I didn't know really any what was going on until George, some of George Fox players started yelling and running off the field. And then um, I don't know if I talked to Kami or Kenyon. I don't think I didn't talk to Kenyon that on that at that moment. I don't know if I talked to Kami though. I might have right after I said, What happened? No, I think they were still on the field because it was still a down. Um, I just remember. Yeah, I think we got a first down actually, which is. <laughs> <cool. laughs> that, that, you know, look at the positive. Look at she looking at the positive in the situation. But. Uh, but no, I didn't, I definitely, when you, cause I was about half field, I think maybe I was by the net, you know, where the net usually is. And I remember you rolling on your back and that's when I realized that something was severely wrong with uh, your leg. And, but I still didn't know that like compound fracture. I didn't even know that happened until Kenyon at home told me, he was like, dude, I saw it. And I was like, couldn't fathom it, you know? And so, when did you start feeling the pain? You know, because I remember when I was little, third grade or something, I fell off the monkey bars and broke both of these bones. They slid over and I had like a Z on my arm. And I didn't really feel the pain as the shock until later when I couldn't get surgery until later. Did you start feeling it on the ride over, that long ride at the hospital? When did you start feeling uh, pain? Yeah, so obviously on the field, I was like pumped full of adrenaline because that was, you know, the first time that I was going to get to like play in forever. So I was super hyped. So, like, I didn't really feel a ton of pain right away. That's why I was able to, like, calm my nerves and stuff. Um, but, like, once I got on the cart and then we were driving over – or, okay, well, first, when they tried to put it in the air cast, like, when they had all those doctors and PT guys out there and stuff, because I was down for, like, 15 minutes. I don't know. Is that how long it felt to you? I, No, honestly, I don't know how long I was down. I kind of just, like, felt like a really long time, and then I knew there was loads of people around me. It was, it was one of the longer injuries. I've only been through one that was longer, and that was a neck injury. Oh yeah. And that's, you gotta be so careful with that. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, it felt like 15 to 20 minutes though, for sure. I think it was, I think it was about 15 minutes, but um, yeah. So once that got kind of, once we were like in the midst of that, like I started really feeling it and then they put the air cast on just to try to like keep everything together ish. Um, and I really started feeling it then. And then the cart, my leg was like, my foot was kind of hanging off the cart. So like the bouncing of the car did that hurt. And then on the ambulance ride too, I, I had to ask, like, I didn't want pain meds at first. I was just going to try to like tough it out. And then like driving like that, it was, it was too much. So I had to have some pain meds. And so, yeah, I was pumped full of drugs that night. Let me tell you, they gave me a lot of stuff. You I said mean, you went into when you, as soon as you got there, you went straight into surgery, right? 
Um, no, not actually. Uh, so the surgeon that, cause they, we needed like one specific surgeon. They couldn't just be like anybody really. So they had to call this guy into, I don't know if he was at home or if he was already in another surgery or something, but they said it was going to be a couple hours before he could even be there. So like, I have a feeling he was at home or something and they just had to call him and get him into work. But, um, so we drove to the hospital, uh, which was Providence, which is like West side of Portland. Um, and then uh, we got we got there. They dra- they wheeled me inside and stuff. And then they had to take me to the pediatrics area for some reason, because they said like anybody um, 21 and younger is considered pediatric in their in their eyes. So I was getting wheeled into this room or this like like waiting area and stuff where there's like kids all around and like families and stuff. And they didn't cover my ankle, so I had to like ask the the uh, the EMT to like cover my ankle so I didn't scar some kid for life. And then. I'm in his nightmares until he's, until he's dead, you know? So, um, uh, that was, that was a lot, but, uh, so they put me into this room on this tiny little bed. And then uh, one of the nurses had to hold my foot up basically because the bed was too short. Um, so there was like, and then more people started flooding in and there's probably like 10 people inside this tiny little room at one point, just like basically just trying to figure out what to do with me. And, uh, you know, they were talking to me and I was like, I was still calm. You know, I, I didn't really freak out other than on the field, I think through most of this, which was good. You know, like you get like your nerves later on and like anxiety and like anger of like, why did this happen to me? But you can't dwell on that. And that was all later anyway. But um, so, I mean, I was there and I was just like, you know, trying to stay focused and like talk to people and stay upbeat and everything about it. Cause there's no, I didn't feel there was any point in getting down about it. It happened. Um, so uh let's see so then after about an hour or so they took me into like the room where I was going to end up having my first surgery and then uh all those nurses and everybody followed and uh, they gave me some more pain medicine because it started hurting again and I think this time I think they gave me Zolotl which is like the step above morphine so it was pretty heavy stuff um and they gave me a pretty fat dose of it too so you know I was feeling all right then you know, um, so I, wa- I ended up watching like the game, I think like the third quarter of the game. And then uh, my surgeon came and talked to me for a little bit. And, uh, and then he had to go do something else. And then they ended up like everybody kind of just left the room for like an hour or two. So this was maybe three hours after my like the after the injury um that they started coming back in and prepping me for surgery so it might have been three and a half hours before I actually had the surgery but uh yeah so they the first one they just put the bone back in and then basically straightened my foot out and then casted it up so that way it would stay straight so that way the next day they could do like a full surgery and then they cleaned it and everything too but um you know it was only a second play of the game on an astroturf field so there was really no like you know there was no dirt or anything inside of it which was which was a good thing Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was uh, that was interesting, and they gave me uh, they gave me ketamine too, which was a interesting horse tranquilizer, isn't it? Tranquilizer. So uh, yeah, and that was knocked me out, knocked me out my ass for a couple hours. But yeah, and then I had my surgery the next day. Everything went really well, um, and then yeah, I mean, I just rest and recover up until then, you know. So. A quick digression. You know, in World War One, it might have been World War One or World War Two. They carried morphine on them so that when someone was about to die or had a bad injury, they would just shoot them up with morphine and then keep going. Yeah, yeah, it was brutal. World War Two, uh, morphine wasn't invented until after, like I think it was like 1943. Mm-hmm. The interesting story is invented off of mold, like moldy fruits. Really? Yeah, yeah. So did um, penicillin, right? Oh, am I thinking of penicillin? I might be I, thinking of penicillin. I think you might be. Yeah, well, there you go. Well, well, thank you, mold off for actually not thank you for me. I'm I'm allergic to penicillin and amoxicillin. Really? Yeah, oh. it's actually pretty common. How did you? Oh, uh, so I I used to get strep really bad, right? I used to get strep, and um, I don't know. One time, I never really went to the doctor for it, and I when this, the first time I I got it really bad, I went to the doctor, and they gave me penicillin and amoxicillin. I think they gave me amoxicillin and I swelled up, got all these hives. So, um, so that I have to do like Z packs, the other, you know, type of antibiotic, but yeah, let's go back to the injury. Um, directly after the game, not, 
during because obviously thinking about you the whole time but like in that moment we're all here you know afterwards when i was riding back on the bus dude like one of the first thoughts i thought was like damn i hope mitch is all right and also you know what is his steps going to be next you know i didn't think like oh you know what is he going to do you know but what is his steps going to be you know because that's a it was a brutal injury you know um do you have set physical therapy when you're going to start work, walking, working? When are you going to start working, Mitch? You need to get a job. Uh, I'm trying to. I, there's not very many jobs that allow you to work without walking. So <laughs> I know. I know. Um, but um, uh, when are you going to start, like, start yeah. doing the walking therapy, things like that? Do you have a plan? Well, I start, actually started my PT two days ago, I think, Monday. Or, yeah, a couple days ago. Um, so uh, that, was, that was good. Um, it was nice to actually, like, have something tangible. Uh, the PT is extremely easy. It's just like moving my toes like this and then trying to get them to be able to go up, which is pretty tough right now. I, you know, I can curl them a little bit and then we're trying to get my ankle to be able to do this again. Cause I like, it's completely immobilized. Like I can't, you know, I, I can't really, I really can't do anything with it right now. Um, and then other than that, it's just like basic mobility. You know, I, I do like the ABCs with my foot. Um, couple other small things but it's very 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 basic right now I'm still extremely incapacitated so um but the timeline wise I think um theoretically in maybe uh six weeks I would say I can start trying to walk again like getting my that rehab set um so that would be about three and a half months after the injury um or after my surgeries and stuff so you know, three to four, three and a half to four months after the, after the surgeries. Um, so that's, you know, it's within reach, you know, I've done longer than that already. You know, I've, I'm about eight weeks, uh, you know, from it. So, you know, it doesn't really seem as long as it used to, which is, which is really good feeling. Um, but then I have to get another surgery after that to get the screws out of my foot. So that's going to probably be another month of no walking. So I would say I probably can't start like my real 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 walking pt for another four months three months maybe so. and like knowing that and you know you said it doesn't seem as long as you felt eight weeks ago but knowing that you know how do you stay positive through it all you know like because you you mean i'm sure there's moments where you feel down there's moments when we all feel down but how do you get yourself through it you know how do you are you looking forward to playing in the future are you looking forward to a specific thing are you taking it day by day how are you taking it yeah, I mean, I don't think there's really much another way to do it than day by day, especially with like something that's severe as mine. Like, I can't say that I'm going to play again, you know, like I really want to. But I mean, if things happen, you know, you, you can never assume that anything is going to go, that anything's going to happen. Um, so like, I'm striving to, you know, I'm striving to be able to run. I want to be 100% again. I want everything to go to go well. But in reality, like, I just have to take it day by day, like do my PT every single day, be conscientious about it. Um, and I have like a really good support system at home. I have, my parents are here, you know, when it first happened, my sister drove up from Reno or I think she flew up from Reno and basically took care of me for five, six days when I needed it. And then my mom came up and took care of me afterwards. And so like I have people there who, you know, who are really, you know, they're really here for me. So um, that definitely makes it easier. Um, I've got so many great friends like here up in, up in Oregon, you know, it's, it's incredible. Like, I mean, the amount of support that I've gotten is like, it's, it's overwhelming. And like my second day in the hospital, I woke up from my surgery or my, I guess my first day in the hospital, I woke up from surgery with like 350 text messages. And it was like, like, I don't know. I was like, I was really high, but I was like welling up. So, you know, it it was pretty, but it was really, really, it was really, really cool. It was really cool. And, uh, and it really helps, you know, I, it'd be really tough to do this without other people. You know, I try to be positive about it, but it's like, if I was in this on my own, you know, I didn't have the the same support system. I didn't have the same amount, like people just saying like, you know, one day at a time, stay positive. Like this, it's all you can do. Then I don't know if I'd be able to do it. But, so. I know you too. And I know you sat there that first day and replied to all those 350 people too. And that's why you have the supporting cast that you do though. It's the person you are, you know, you've built these relationships with all these people, including myself that, you know, love you to death and want the best for you. And like, I'll go back to what I was saying earlier, you know, watching you go through that injury, especially being on the field while it's happening, it, it, it breaks your heart, man. Cause I mean, no one deserves to get injuries and injuries should not happen to anyone. 
but you're one of the guys that it should never happen to. You know what I mean? You are, you do everything right. Like coach Fox says, you, you, you put the time in, you do everything right. You know, there's certain people who do that. And so when it does happen, it shatters, it almost shatters your framework of what is like supposed to happen. What's not, you know, because we all have this kind of morality compass and get into some history stuff where we think, you go far evil, you probably talk about Hitler. You go far good, you're Jesus. You know, we, we all kind of fit in the middle, you know. Yeah. And but you, there's sometimes there's people like you or Kyle, who are just closer to Jesus than they are ever to Hitler. And yeah. when something like that happens to you, um, it kind of shatters it and it makes you like, it puts you in place of how vulnerable and how fragile life is. You know. I mean, before we get any farther, like. I don't like being compared to Jesus is great, but being compared to Kyle is one of like the finest compliments I think I've ever gotten. So I appreciate that. But no, I mean, like, I don't think it, yeah, anybody, nobody deserves it, but like, I kind of just taken like the absurdist point of view on it where like, you know, what happens happens, you know, I can't change, I can't change it. Like, so why not just like make the most of the situation? You know, I've never done this kind of PT before on my leg. Maybe it's going to come back stronger. Like, who knows what's the future going to hold? I don't know, but yeah. Cause so I've been reading uh Camus like recently. So what's that? Um, he's a French philosopher and uh, like he's, I don't think he's like the Godfather, but I just, he just writes about absurdism. I don't really know the history of philosophy that well. I just really like his work and his prose. So yeah. Um, so he writes about absurdism, which is just like the, you know, what happens happens. Like the world is what it is. Like you're not going to be able to understand it any better. Mm -hmm um based on like the frameworks and our own minds so we just have to like you know just be just live and make what you want out of it i don't know it's a it's a cool i don't know it's a cool uh thought process i guess um mm -hmm. but, uh, i guess you can lose meaning in some ways but like for me like the meaning is just like being with people being around people you know like enjoying my life that's kind of where I, where I was at with it. But. It's a good meaning to have. Um, yeah. And it's not as, uh, it's not as meaningless as existentialism or even not determinism to, to some extent, you know, um, I like that. I'll have to look into that. Um, yeah, dude, you know, philosophy, we could get into that in so many ways. Um, but just for you specifically, you know, I think reading's very important. You're, you're a guy who likes to exercise his mind as much as his body. And so right now I know I was actually just talking to a professional boxer who injured his shoulder. And so he was like, yeah, I've just been, he's like, I haven't been able to do that one thing that always can clear my mind, which is boxing or training. And so he's like, I've had to stimulate my mind in other ways. Have you found that to be the case for you? You've had to stimulate your mind because you haven't been, you've had lack of physical exercise and things like that. Yeah. I mean, um, with school, I uh, I was really busy with school towards the end because I missed basically three weeks. So um, basically up until a week ago or so, I was super duper busy with that, trying to catch up. Um, and I, you know, I'm still, I'm still not bored yet for not doing much, but I can already feel like the boredom taking in. And that's why I got, I've been getting more books. You know, I, I've been watching more TV, like things that like, I can't be active with, you know, which I want to be. Um, I've been going on more walks or rolls, I guess. Like I just get on my little scooter and then roll around the neighborhood and stuff and talk to people. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be easier with more people coming back, but um, like coming back to my home from college and stuff, but mm. it's, you know, it, it's, you're always fighting boredom, right? Like even in, even when you're completely normal. So it's just like, I think it's the mindset that you have to take towards your daily actions and like be really deliberative, deliberate deliberate excuse me very deliberate in your in your uh, in your motivations and very deliberate in uh, in your actions that you take on a daily basis and like boredom kind of ceases a little bit if each each thing you do you have a, a a meaning behind it and each thing you do you you really think about because I mean there's so many amazing things going on around you like you were just talking about earlier that it was windy and like if you really just pay attention to the wind and like watch the trees move and stuff like I know it sounds really like boring and weird but like there's like a lot you can learn like just i don't know in your own in your own head like you can figure out like how you have such a really a really short attention span or you can figure out like different flaws within yourself because once you see something you can like express your own characteristics on it and then start thinking about how like you need to be more i mean because we, we we um you know uh put a uh, compare i guess ourselves 
you know, to, to everything around us. So it's, and at least I do. So it's really easy for me to watch something and then kind of see how, you know, that that's compares to my flaws or that compares to my, my beliefs and things like that. So. Well, you also have a better outlook than most people. I think, I think you look at it as, Oh, there's something that that has that I also have, or there's something that I have that that also has, like, let's talk about the palm tree outside, you know? Um, and I think a lot of people look at it as like, there's something that that has and I don't have it, you know, instead of finding the commonality, the similarities between you and the lamp, whether it be a lamp, I'm just, sorry, I just looked at a lamp, but, or the tree oh, no. or dogs or anything, you find the, the commonalities, the, the beauty in it. And a lot of people find really the ugly to make themselves feel better. And that's really a, it's a really um, cool to see you do that because it shows that you're not really insecure. A lot of the the reasons people do that is because they're so insecure in, the, in their own skin. They can't find the love themselves. And to see you going through an injury and still finding the wind to be cool and walks talking to people, it, it's, really, it's really beautiful to see that. Have you found that going on walks and just being outside has been more enjoyable than when you just had, when you had two legs? Um. Yeah. I mean, I really liked hiking before. Like that was a huge thing I loved doing. Um, but, uh, I mean like now, like obviously like I just think of it like my daily adventure is going to be to, to get up and go outside for a little bit. And like, that's harder than any hike I've ever done before. Like I am just exhausted afterwards if depending on how far I go, you know? Um, so like, I guess that's just more my, you know, that's my workout for the day. That's my, you know, that's my adventure. And, um, and I think a lot of that just comes down to your mindset. I mean, it's, it's really hard to do, but uh, being able to have a positive mindset in specific situations like that, or uh, I think it's really valuable. And um, I want to go back to like what you were saying. Um, I don't think it's like I have a, a better mindset about those kinds of things. I just think that um, you have to kind of go through something very significant to be able to change your mindset about anything. Like if you're just living in a homeostatic, like, you know, white walls around you and like nothing that you would have, your mind would be molded based on your environment, I think a lot. And you might know more about this being your philosophy, you know, you're really into that stuff. So like, um, but the way that I've always thought about it was like, I mean, the people around me are basically like fragment or basically I'm just like a bunch of fragments of the other people around me and that's kind of who I've become. So I think me being in, in a lot of ways, like I think my most positive characteristics are from the people that made me the, my parents, you know, my friends, my, my teammates, my family, like all these people who have basically like been behind me my entire life and given me all this stuff. Like I just see myself as a positive reflection of them and, and I have to represent the positive things that they've given me. And that's why I try to be positive like that. And I don't think I'm like better, like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's just, that's, I try to put what they have taught me into action. I think. One of my favorite analogies is that every, if everyone knows 100 people, now I'm not a math major, so if you get the math wrong, everyone, do not come from my head. You're one person, so that means you're one person away from 100 people or 1,000 people because if everyone knows 100 people, then you're one person away from 1,000 people. You're two people away from 10,000 people, and you're three people away from a million people. So that's correct. I think it would be one more zero. But yeah, I get you. Hundred Because 100 times 100, right, isn't that? uh 10,000 so yeah so you're 10 dude, are you kidding me right now what? What? terrible at math dude like let me just do the math real quick <laughs> before we before we finish this conversation 100 times 100 10,000 okay so that means you're two people oh you're one person away from 10,000 10,000 and you're two people away from a million no wait, wait. you're two people away from a <laughs> oh Stop this, bro. This is too listen, much. Time. Hey, listen, 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 listen. If this shows up on TikTok, I do not. I do not learn. I, I do not learn math. I do not learn math. We both study like political science. Yeah. And we're the humanities guys. We don't do this stuff. You want to talk about the degeneration of the Soviet Union? Come for me. We can talk about that all day long, but a hundred times a hundred. No, <laughs> I guess not, dude. Um, <laughs> let me tell you about this TikTok I just posted. Right. Okay. I posted a TikTok from, I'm having him back on because it, I'll, you'll see why. So I, I had the virologist on, the guy who studies viruses, right? Posted a one minute clip of him talking about the vaccines and the danger of the vaccines when they first started. Talking about how they, 
and how they were taught oh. the dangers were that it caused anaphylactic shock once in a while. Mm-hmm. When I tell you I have more comments than likes on my TikTok, 10,000 views, I think, or close to 10,000 views and like 100 to 150 comments, just people arguing the no. anti-vaxxers versus the vaxxers. And bro, I, I saw that. I was like, I was like, bro, that was a, that was a ballsy thing to post. Like, I mean, like what he said, I, I mean, me personally, I was like, makes sense to me. Like, I mean, he seems like a smart dude, you know, I never met him. I didn't, yeah. I didn't talk to him or anything, but like, he seems like a smart dude. He was making good points and everything. And then I just see like in the comments, I saw like what 80 likes or something like that. And then 150 comments. I was like, Oh boy. Yeah, dude, if I went and checked, let me just check right now and see how many, much more I got because... I, like I like your TikTok page too. It's, I mean, it's been good, dude. I think that's a great way to, to like promote the podcast too. I mean, I've seen... Yeah. Some, it takes one video for you to really just come like huge, you know? I, I've been telling a lot of people that I don't really want to be huge. I just want to have... I mean, I am building... I'm slowly building... I have a decent amount of people who listen. We were talking about this earlier, but I want to build a solid foundation of people who listen to the show. And then I'll be, cause I, I want to be a lawyer and I want to do other things in my life. I don't want this to be my sole priority, but it's fun to do. And I like talking to people, you know, it's, it's, it's well, a good thing. I mean, honestly, that's like, in my personal opinion, I think you're one of the most charismatic people that I've ever met. Really? Thank you. Well, yeah. I mean, you've been able to have conversations and like basically build hour and a half long podcasts, which is, and in completely wide variety of people, people that it would sometimes, you know, conversations, I feel like they're going to come to a lull and then you just happen to find a, a question or a way to move forward with it. And it's, it's really, it's impressive. I mean, I, I always thought that was a really impressive like feat that you were able to do even in just normal conversations. Yeah. That's kind of why I started the podcast. Like I'm not, I'm not going to say I've, I've always been like great at speaking or anything like that or talking, but I've always had a certain conversation skill, I feel like. And so I tried like I could always keep something more engaging just for myself personally in a conversation. And now just doing this, however many times, you know, I've, I've gotten my conversation, conversating skills. I don't, something like that have gotten way better because just because it's, it is a, it is something cause every, this is what I've learned. Everybody has something fascinating to talk about. It's just, do you have the skill to get it out of them? That's all talking is. That's all conversating is. Is everybody has the everybody's human and humans are fascinating, man. Dude, I've talked to so many people and every time I get something out of them, I'm just like, thank you. Teach me something about yourself, man. This is really all it is. It's an hour and a half course on whoever this person sitting in front of me is. That's how I take it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people are amazing, dude. People are amazing. I've and that's why I want to travel too. Like. You know, I've been very limited in my traveling up to now and stuff, but like every time I've gone anywhere and just like sat down and talked to someone and like, those are the moments that I remember. It's not like seeing like a, a massive, I don't know, like a massive building or something cool like that. Like those things stick in your head, but you remember like when somebody showed you like incredible amounts of kindness, you know, you go to somebody's house and eat inside their house and they just give you food for free or like they, somebody just talks to you or like somebody will give you a ride or like, just small things like that. When someone shows you kindness, those are the things I think that stick in your head more specifically about, about a place or people or, you know, I know that's how I've always felt at least. So I know you study history and I know you love history. If there was one place you could travel, where would it be? Time, time and place or just a place specifically time and place. Okay. Um, Hmm. There's so many events that just like, it would be so amazing to see. Like, I, I really want to see um, the siege of Vienna when the Turks were uh, invading, like basically, it was basically like the Christian world against the Muslim world. Just like the, the vast, like the pure numbers of people invading a, a single city. That would be incredible. I, I don't remember the exact date. Um, it was, I think it was like mid 1400s. Um, but uh, that would be like an incredible thing to see um like now just places i want to go like i, I really want to go to germany but that's partly because a lot of my um historical studies have been based on germany and i'm learning german and stuff like that and i i'm really interested in in german history and stuff not necessarily just world war ii i know everybody talks about world war ii but like 
I think Germany has as like a as a geographical area has a really really interesting history because Germany as as a country is very new. I think it was 1880 something that they basically formed into a nation. And before then it was just a bunch of principalities all in in the area and making up the Holy Roman Empire and stuff for a long time. So but uh it's really interesting stuff. Um but that would be really cool to see. Uh, you know, I would love to just see like Athens back in the day. You know, I want to see the Library of Alexandria. That would be a, one I really, really would love to see before it got burned. You know, Statue of Colossus, um, the building of the pyramids. I mean, I could go on all day about things I'd want to see. It's just yeah. like, you know, I'd love to meet, but like, it'd be really cool too to meet my family, you know, like meet my old family. That's something I think not a lot of people think about, but like one of the really unique characteristics, like you could go meet, you know, I don't know, Julius Caesar, or Marcus Aurelius, or I mean, these great, the great leaders in history, but it would be really cool to meet your family and be able to like explain to them the, like the past, however, you know, the past, the next, however many years it is and like tell them basically about how, what your family does and stuff like breaking the space time continuum and <laughs> doing all that stuff. But you know. I haven't thought about talking to my family. That's awesome. That that would be very, very, very awesome. If I if I could go anywhere in, in time, I think I would go talk to Socrates in Athens. Dude, yeah. Uh, any philosopher would have been. Wow. Could you imagine that? Like No, dude, I couldn't. Dude, they were just like, why? But why? I feel like Socrates was just if Plato wrote Socrates correctly, I feel like he was just a a conscientious dick, really. And that'd be awesome just to hear this one guy who I I'm smarter than you. Cause I know nothing. Just see him just like wiping out the way people think really. And then just getting executed would just be fascinating. Incredible. I mean, who was the guy too? the, uh, uh, he was another Greek philosopher. Um, Di- Dionysus, I think, uh, I don't know. He was like the, like the lazy philosopher, I guess that just like, um, I think, uh, uh, Alexander had a quote. He said it, uh, if I wasn't Alexander the Great, I'd want to be uh, this guy. I, I think his name's, I, I can't remember his name, but he was just, he would just basically just chill. And he was like the, the art of chill. It was like his philosophy, he just like would lay around and people would like come and basically ask him how not to care about everything. And he pretty much explained to the world about how not to care about everything. And there's this famous story of Alexander meeting him for the first time, whether it's true or not. I mean, that's, history is you know whatever is true it, nobody knows but um so like uh, alexander comes and meets this guy and he's like laying in the sun and uh, alexander comes and like stands over him and he says like dionysus or whatever his name is um like teach me how to like teach me how to be like you or something and he's like the first step is uh to take one step to the left because uh, you're blocking my sunlight and he basically says that to the most powerful man in the world just like to move out of my way because you're blocking the sun like what an incredible, like, if you actually had those kind of balls, that'd be pretty cool. Um, that, that made me lose my question I had for you, but, the, oh, yeah, I was going to say this, but that's hilarious, first off. But um, if the cool thing about history is what, like you said, whether or not it did happen, the way all of society has been foundation, the foundation of all of society comes from stories of other humans. Yeah. Yeah. We are great storytellers. It's why we love music. It's it's a story. It's why we love movies. It's a story. It's why we love books. They're all stories, you know. Mm-hmm. And at some point, I want to know so bad. When did we jump from con- from not conscious to conscious, or was it slow and then developing? When did it happen? Yeah. When did we think? Therefore, we are. You know, that's like when did that happen? Yeah. That's a it's a tough question. I mean when can we ever know? Like, I don't think we'll ever know. Right. I mean, no, maybe all we, all we can do is all we can do is pretty much write down what we, you know, what was already written down, you know, and, and we fill in the gaps and stuff. And, you know, as uh, new documents come to come to rise or new genetic testing or new testing in general comes, comes to light, that's when we can start filling in more gaps or being more correct about certain things. And I think that's, uh, I was always getting frustrated with, with people, especially in the past, like five, six years. And people get really mad when they hear the words revisionist history, when all of history is just revision. I mean, we're constantly revising history to, to become, you know, more, more correct, I guess, in the best way we can. 
And people claim that when history is changed or when we find out new things or like the history, the, so, so to quote, the history books are to change. Like it's a bad thing when it's just, it is like, we're just trying to be more correct that historians aren't, they don't have a political motive behind it. They're just trying to be more correct. And if that gets in the way of your political motive, then maybe you were wrong. Like, I don't, you know. It seems as though if you trace them both back down, one to England, one to really everywhere, that's kind of the foundation of conservatism versus progressiveness mm -hmm. is holding on to the past and the traditions of the past and getting rid of them for something that's better. You know, so that's funny that you say that because you, you, you are leaning more progressive, which I feel like I am more too, but, yes, um, so you wanting to revise and, and be more accurate is a very progressive idea as opposed to holding on to tradition, whether it was wrong or not. It's like the Bible argument. We clearly understand that the Bible is not factual every spot, like Noah's Ark, things like that. Um, uh, Moses parting the Red Dead Sea. Now that might've happened because of some scientific thing that we thought about, but whatever. Um, we know it's, that it's controversial for you to say those things to some people, which yeah. is it's kind of outlandish in, in our heads. You know what I mean? Because it's like, we're so like the way that at least our university systems and our academia is structured. It's like, we're very evidence focused. Like if you don't have five things backing up what you're saying, then what you're saying is probably wrong or it's not going to be accepted. So like when a Bible, which, which is a historical book, so to speak, with no sourcing material, you know, there's no, like, I mean, there's very, it's, it's basically a book of stories in reality. Like we don't know what is real and what is fake. And that's, what's hard about it, right? Like it's hard to take it as a true historical document without the types of sourcing material that, you know, that we're. So. Yeah. Isn't that the argument too? It's historical document versus religious tradition. Like, because like a religious, it gets really tricky when you start talking about religious truth is factual truth. Because what's true in a religion and how to act religiously and faithfully could make you a morally better person on the, on the grand scheme of things. But it couldn't be fact, it might not be factually correct. And so it's like the, the age old argument, do you tell your son that Santa Claus exists because it makes them believe in things and makes their, their life feel more open and, and, and engaging or do you, which is a lie, or do you factually tell them the truth to make them more scientific? But that only, I feel like if we don't have some sort of belief or religious truth, you could say belief or religious truth, whatever you want, then you don't have that core element of eyes, like eyes wide, that childlike openness to the world you know you don't believe in people unless you see hard evidence you know and i think so they both are true in a sense true as in straight as in an arrow but they're not science versus religion is a very big debate right now but i mean i think um that's why at least for me who's somebody who's, who's really not religious at all i still have an infatuation with with like fantasy like i love reading the lord of the rings i love reading the hobbit and stuff it's because i like I still desire to have like that, that hope that the infatuation with something that, you know, maybe seems a little bit out, outlandish. Like I don't, obviously I don't believe the the stuff in that, in those books are real, but it's like, I like to place my, you know, my, my mind in there. And I like to, to imagine that like I'm living in it or something like that, but that's just what real, you know, I, it, like your, your entire life can't be just entirely based on science. Like, I mean, what, what we do is uh, as humans is like so creative based and so like story driven, like you were just saying, you know, humans are great storytellers, right? Like it'd be a shame if, if we just stopped telling those stories, you know? It's yeah, dude. And you're getting into something that I was getting into with a lot of the more creative people, not that you're not creative, obviously, but like John Gay, who's a visionary artist and some of the other painters and things like that, where they, I believe them to be almost tapping into something that I can't see, right? One, because yeah. I'm colorblind, but two, just because I'm not, yeah. I make music or that's kind of my creative outlet or talking is kind of my creative outlet. I can't paint for shit or draw. Um, so, you know, I feel like creativity, like you said, is not, we could throw it into the religious or well, the argument like scientific versus religious truth and that's its own kind that's kind of fits more with the religious truth or the or the paranormal i guess is the word for it truth because there is a world there is a realm that exists through humans consciousness that doesn't necessarily exist because you can alter your consciousness 
let's not get into that, but you can, like, you can, you can, like, you can drink a glass of wine. You can, you know, do a lot of different things to alter your consciousness. And that changes your perception on how you believe things. You can smile more than that. You can be happy or sad. Those change your perceptions, you know, depression versus extra positivity changes how you view the world. Um, and there's also like things like paintings that did not exist before they are painted. Where did that come from? Movies, the Avengers, things like that. We all like, there are things that are paranormal. And when I'm saying paranormal, I don't mean ghosts. I hope you mean not you, but everyone else. I mean, in, in the realm of supernatural that exist, that everybody can understand, but no, that it's not tangible, you know? Yeah, no, totally. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that is, that's create, that's creation, right? Like that's creativity. I mean, the two words come from the same, you know, they're the same root, right? Creation and creativity. <clears throat> but um, I mean, what people can do is, is, is incredible. I mean, like art is ha like, how does something that, that has, I mean, no, no words written to it, no, no meaning other than like what you see, like, how does that give you like such, they can give some people such emotion. And like, there are paintings that, that just like blow my head away. I'm just like, wow, like or blow my mind away. You know, I'm just, Starry I mean, Night's one of them for me. It's a beautiful one. Right? And I like, I love uh, The Wanderer Over the Fog, which is a, an old old painting. I, I absolutely love that one. But, um, and music too, you know, you can just like, I've been really like digging classical music lately. And I just listen to some music and I'm like, like I can like feel it. And I'm like, oh, like, wow. Like, I mean, I don't understand. Like, I don't understand, but like this has meaning to me. And that's pretty incredible. Like how that, something with no words just can have meaning to a human being. It's, it's uh, one of my favorite things in the world is music. I like to make music, write music. I don't really put it out, but I, it's one of my favorite things to do. But there's a universal feeling with music, any music, whatever you're into, where if you hear it for the first time and it gives you that feeling, you play it again, you play it again until you kind of, it's kind of down back here in the realm of the other, of the other songs that you listen to. But there's a universal feeling for a great song or a song you love when you hear it the first time that everyone can tap into. Um, one of the songs for me like that, that I get those chills every time I hear it again is All Girls Are the Same by Juice World. That was one of the, my first Juice World song that I ever heard. And that dude, every time I hear it, it gives chills in my spine because I just remember sitting in the back of my friend's car and he dropped it on Cole Bennett's page and my friend Jake, who's now uh, actually doing pretty well for himself on TikTok and making music. He said, this is Juice World. He's next up and he played it, dude. And I just wanted to hear it all day long. And I can remember that. And you can almost, music almost takes you to a place that you were when you heard that song for the first time. And art, like you said, great art does that too. But I just like music because it's so vulnerable to the artist but it's mm -hmm. also vulnerable to the listener and arts like that too but i'm just more in touch well, with music i guess the tools of the time too you know i mean um obviously now like I mean, music is so much more accessible for a lot of people it's easier to make music i think that for a lot of people and get it out there than it is art so it's, it's easier to be to be like that whereas for a very long time art was like the easiest way to express oneself you know, I mean, music takes talent in the fact that, you know, you have to know how to play an instrument or like it takes practice in the way that you have to know an instrument, whereas some people are just naturally gift gifted artists, right? Like I think Picasso had mastered realism and a bunch of other things when he was like 18 or something like that. And that's why he just started basically making art that looked like a, you know, look like child's art, but he added so much depth to it. And uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Like he was a visionary, right? And so... And I think that's amazing because his, his real, like you can see, I think you can go to the, uh, the museum, which I think is like in Spain or Portugal. I'm not, I'm not certain, but um, you can see like his old paintings and he would, I mean, if he did like the realism and stuff, the stuff that everybody like likes to look at um, his whole life, like he would still probably be considered one of the greatest artists of all time because of how good and good and gifted he was at such, such a young age. But you know, his, his real creative passion and his desire was to make something that made him feel like a child again. Right. So and that's, and that's a lot of it. That's a lot of people's. So the wisest man, you know, let's go of his childhood to become an apprentice or a worker and then finds it again when he's an old man. That's the, that's the tale, right? Um, you let go of your childhood to be an adult and then you let go of being an adult to be a child again. Yeah. Um, I thought about this the other day. This is a very philosophical thought when I was driving. I was listening to a song and he was talking about how 
the caterpillar thought life was over, then he turned into a butterfly, right? And I thought that's honestly a very religious argument. You, if, you, like, let's say you're talking to somebody who's like, you say you're a religious person, I am, and you're arguing with um, Jesus dying and going to heaven or anybody dying and going to heaven. Mm-hmm. You can just say, well, look what happens on earth, right? Caterpillars don't even go anywhere else. But they go from a worm. You can attribute a worm to a human and they turn into a butterfly with wings or an angel. That's, it's, it's a crazy analogy, but you can, really, you can see it, you know? Mm-hmm. It goes from a, not a dull, but a, a normal thing to a most, one of the most beautiful things just through transformation. Yeah, that's interesting. Death and, or the phoenix is an example of that too. Yeah. Through fire. I just, I've always like, my perspective on it is, um, you know, when, when you die, like, I mean, I, I don't know, like, I mean, when, when you were you born 2000? Yeah. Like 2000. What was life like in 1999, right? Have no idea. So uh, when you die, like, I mean, it's not intangible. Like it is, it's hard. It's impossible to think about the nothingness, but like you've already also experienced nothingness, right? I mean, does, does that count? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. That's, That's kind of the argument, right? Have we, or have we not? Yeah. You know, I mean, would do our, would, is, I mean, are we human? I don't know. It's, it's hard to think about like, cause consciousness is so fragile and you don't know you're conscious until you're conscious. And that's so hard to imagine anything before or, I mean, after theoretically, right. I mean, that's something I don't think you're ever going to be able to understand. It's, it's the ultimate question, right. It's the, it's the existentialism. It's, you know, I mean, when, when are we ever going to know, right. It, on your death, when you die, right. That's the only moment you're ever going to know. And then it's going to be too late to tell anyone. So. Yeah. Dude, I, you see, this is why I started this podcast right here. Cause I lay in bed and I think these thoughts anyways, so now I have another person to go through it with me. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's, it's scary stuff. I mean, but. Fascinating. I, I cannot tell you the amount of times that I just lay in my bed, just like, God, I wish I was podcasting right now. Cause the thoughts, do they just roll across my brain? If I let them. You get like a little journal or something. And I know. Question. Sometimes when that's happening, I'll, do my clips for my podcast or something because dude i can get trapped in my own podcast really i really can i can just start thinking about thoughts and i don't know i always learned one time that the most i'm not saying i'm a great thinker i'm not albert einstein or anything like that i'm not i'm not even that smart like i'm smart but i'm not that smart but i was listening to something one time and they said the greatest thinkers were the most creative because you can't come up with new ideas unless you're creative right Mm -hmm. and so now my my brain my ideas are not to the extent of awesomeness that those ideas are but my brain constantly just makes no ideas on things that exist like consciousness or philosophical ideas or what to talk about with somebody else or who to talk to next you know and and if i let it it just will roll and so one of the, one things that this podcast does when i do multiple one day i do one it lets me relax in my own head you know i don't know if anyone else experiences maybe i'm just crazy i don't know but i it's called flow, right? I mean, yeah. That's what people say is like when you get to this like almost supernatural state of just being able to do things and you like, you don't know where your mind goes, right? I mean, any other moment in time, if you ever think about like what you're doing, like you can get in your own head very easily. And then but there's this certain specific moment when you just find like you're doing something that you love. When people play music, they get it. When people do art, they get it. When you podcast or think about podcasting and stuff, like it's, or do music maybe like that's when you have it right it's it happens to everybody at different times it's just i used to get that with sports too football it's kind of hard because for you it's not really because i play a position where it's like you get thrown into the like the angst of it for me and then you get pulled out of it you might not play ever again or next half you know because you never know fourth down always comes but are you going to go for it are you going to punt are you going to you know you never know um but basketball i remember basketball and volleyball dude those were the two sports that i played in high school that were not basketball and soccer or that were not football and soccer too that i could get in those flow states where you're like trapped by the pure moment yeah dude i love sports we can get into that because dude sports are the one thing watching lebron last night hit that dagger or i mean obviously i know I know it, that's the other thing though. Like it's like fans versus uh, when your when your team goes down, but it's like that emotion yeah. that you feel with sports, man. And that's, it's, it's an art of its own. 
man, it's why we play it. It's why we do it. It's why we can't give it up. It's because it's, there's this, it's the unknowingness. It's it's that paranormal realm. You don't you didn't know LeBron was gonna hit that. No one did. It goes. It feels like it's going in slow motion. That's when when everybody like clips it and makes it slow motion. It feels like it was like that in the moment. Yeah. And it's, mer- it's amazing. You know, it's 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 indescribable almost. Like, you know, it's. I mean, seeing those things. Like, I mean, you don't even have to be there in person. But if you have that level of investment, you know, that's it's incredible to watch and. Honestly, I don't, I don't know if I ever really get it with football because I'm always just thinking so much about like what I'm supposed to be doing and what, what could happen, what needs to happen. Like, but I used to get it with baseball because that's like, I'm so in control of my own, like when I pitched, so in control of my own, like my own stuff. Like I can't, I, I have to be good. Like I have to do these specific things. Right. And it's like, uh, it's not that like the world revolves around you in that moment, but it's like, like everything relies on you and that's I don't know it's it was like a freeing mindset I guess for me is that like you know I have to do certain things I have to be a certain way and then I would just like get into that flow state which was cool and I happen to be in volleyball too which is because volleyball is just so fun though it is so fun kind of flow, but. dude when I was on varsity as a sophomore and playing volleyball we were in the playoffs or the game before playoffs and Rancho the other team I think it was the game before playoffs but the ranch, they had this guy who wasn't good at volleyball. He was just a super athlete, could jump really high and hit really hard. Yeah. And I remember playing, and I remember how scared I was, dude, playing like as a sophomore on varsity um, in a sport that I had never played before, except for the year prior on JV as a freshman, dude. It was like, I know I like tr- played with my sisters. My sister was playing college at the time and stuff so she had been playing for her entire high school career so we played a little bit but I was not nearly as good as her like you know good at volleyball and I just remember I was but it was so fun and I was so in the moment and, and you can't recreate the the moments that sports or anything that you love makes you feel like you can't recreate that unless you do it you know yeah and that's one of my favorite quotes too is the Teddy Roosevelt the man in the arena like it's uh he basically just talks about like the, you know, the only person who were, who will ever like feel real glory or feel real defeat, like feel real emotion is the one who goes out and tries, tries to, you know, the critic is, you know, the person who watches from the stands, they never feel like real emotion. Like they're always just going to be like a passive observer and maybe they'll get a swing at things, but like, you know, it's like victory and defeat. Like those are like, it's, it's, it's indescribable, right? Like when you, when you feel real investment into something and you genuinely care and then like either like it's validated with, with a win or like it's torn away with a, with a defeat, it's, it's impossible to describe that feeling. It's just, you know, it's it's something that you can't, you can't experience or you can't, you can't, you know, tell somebody who's never had that experience before. But I think like you and I, we both felt that, right. You know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to describe. Elon Musk, to go off your quote, Elon Musk once said, he was like, if you try and fail and try and fail and try and fail, you're still winning because you're doing better than everybody else because you tried, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, all of the paranormal aside, back to like you and everything that's going on with you and your life and what is your motive right now? Like, what are you excited for in the future? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm excited to get walking again. Like that's, I mean, it's more of a long term, I guess, couple months away. But like, I'm really excited to get that back. I'm excited just, I mean, in the day to day stuff, like I'm excited to see my friends, I'm excited to see my family. You know, I, I appreciate seeing my dog every day. It was something that I missed when I was at, when I was up at school. It was like, I always miss my dog. And now I get to see him every single day. And like, that's awesome. Like, so cool. But uh, I don't know. I mean, it's just a, it's a day-to-day motivation, right? When you're, when you're kind of in a, sh- in, in a, in a tough spot, when you're, when you're struggling, whether you're like emotionally low, physically low, whatever you're at, like you just have to take it day by day and move forward slowly. But you know, it, it gets better. Every day gets better. Right. I mean, they say, yeah, you never know unless you get up in the morning, you know? Yeah. We yeah. All, I, you would say, yeah. Oh yeah. I was just gonna say, uh, Marcus Aurelius said no glory has ever been won from a, a warm bed. That's a great quote, actually. Yeah. It's uh I may have misquoted it, but I thought it was Marcus Aurelius. So just... it who knows? It's a great quote. Yeah. Marcus Aurelius, 
Mr. The late great Marcus Aurelius. If we just misquoted you, I'm sorry. I'm sure he's not offended. Um, you know, being being great is something I think we all strive for one day. And then I think we get to a certain point where we're like, being great is a battle you got to win in your own eyes. You know, um, you know, like me, like a lot of people, I struggle with really bad mental health problems, and um, I think we've talked about this before, but you know, it's one thing that I have been able to do with this podcast, which is really cool is let my, let me give advice to people that I've learned the hard way, you know, be like, smile, you know, be happy. Happiness is not a destination. It's a choice. Yeah. You're going to choose to look at your life for a certain way. Glass half full. Are you going to look, are you going to look at it? Like you still got a drink. Are you going to look at it like, Oh, someone drank out of my glass. You know, yeah. you gonna let that dude who cut you off, piss you off or what? I think so. I always thought uh, that's not necessarily happiness. Like I would attribute that to being contentment or to being content. You know, I've always thought contentment was the better word. Like, um, you know, you only, you only have to impress two people in your life, childhood you and like what they wanted to see out of you. And then old man, you, which is like, what looking back on your life, like, what did you do? You know, like, when did you, uh, you're not going to remember the moments that you, you didn't, risk something right you're always going to remember the moments that like you know you did risk something or you did be vulnerable for a moment like those are the you know those are the moments you'll remember and those are the moments that you should remember so like contentment is realizing that like you don't have to impress anybody else around you except for you don't even have to impress yourself in the moment you just have to impress future you and old you right that's how I, i've thought of it so no, yeah, I, I think I've heard that before, but that's it. Really, is young you and old you. If you can, if you can make those guys smile, you, you're winning in life. And present you, you can even do the, you can do the whole trifecta. You know, if you can yeah. smile, if you can get your old self smiling at you going forward, and your old you smiling looking back at you, and then you smiling where you're at in the moment, you're succeeding, man. Life is, life is not life is. I like when they say life is a game, but I don't like because life is not a game. Life is a, I like to, I like this analogy. I don't, I think I made it up, but if I didn't, then someone else gets the credit. But I thought about this. I was like, life's like a book, right? But you don't know the name of the book. You, you know the name of the book, but you don't know how the book ends or what really the book is about. You haven't really had it like a summary or anything. And so you can choose to read it two ways. You can rush through it and get to the end and realize, what was the book even about? You know, you rush to the end or you can read it page by page, really engulf in what's happening and have fun on the, the book, have fun with the book along the way, you know? Yeah, that's beautiful. That's a really good way to think of it. I mean, that's like, you can dwell on words. I mean, like, I think books have a lot more impact and I think life has a lot more impact when you slow down and like really, really read it. Because when somebody's writing a book or when you're living your life, so to speak, I, like, I mean, when somebody's writing the book, right, they, they really put a lot of weight into in a lot of the words that they're putting in and they, they spend way more time writing it than anybody will ever read it. So if you sit down and take your time and like really think about it and like enjoy the beauty of certain phrases and stuff, you know, like it's, it adds so much value to a book and you'll love it more. And, you know, maybe it's boring at times, but like if you can find the value in the words, in a new way, then that makes, that makes it valuable. Right. I, and I think that's a, an analogy to life too. Like you slow down and, and realize specific things and focus on specific things and really just, you know, make the, make that choice. Like you were talking about, try to make the choice of being happier, of being content, even when things are going, going astray or going rough, you know, it's like, there's value into that. There's, you, you'll appreciate it later on. So. Well, Mr. Ulrich, thank you for coming on the podcast again. This is a beautiful conversation, as always. Thanks for I love talking me. to you. You're one of the most positive people in the world. I hope you continue to strive to walking again and doing all the things you need to do day by day. Is there anything you want to say? Last thoughts? I appreciate you, man. I appreciate all everybody's listening. You know, I hope you, hope everybody's doing well. Thanks, Mitch. Have a good one.